Hi, everyone. Thank you. It is, uh, it's a real pleasure to be back at SGX and back at Satellite. It's been a couple of years since I had a chance to do that. It's been a couple of years since all of us had a chance to get together with real human beings in real life. Uh, and I, I'm really very glad to be here to see some old friends and meet some new ones. Uh, I'm particularly glad to be uh, on a panel talking about culture, because honestly, it's something that I find our community does not talk about hardly at all, nowhere even close to enough. Uh, I'm pushing, uh, I'm just entering into my third decade working in aerospace. Uh, and I would say for probably the first two decades, no one ever talked to me about culture unless it was just to complain about something they didn't like at their particular place of work. Uh, which I always thought was a little funny. Is like, I ever wonder why you're complaining? If you never talk about this and you never work on it, maybe there's a reason why you don't like it as much as you do. Now, I do want to caveat that. I have to say, I absolutely love this industry. I love my job. I've loved every job I've ever had in this industry, uh, which makes me really lucky. Uh, and I would say probably makes all of you really lucky. For those of you who are already in this field or going into this field, just starting out, been in it a long time. Most people I find who are in aerospace, particularly if you self-select to come to an event like this, you probably are in it because you're passionate about this field. And you think that the work that we do matters, um, not just to us as individuals and not just to you know, our bank balance, but to the planet and to the future of our species. And, that's a great feeling. So I have always loved this job, these jobs, this industry. Uh, I've always loved the people I work alongside, including, you know, this is a fun industry because we get to root for our competitors, which I suspect a lot of your friends from high school or college, they don't do that. You know, if, I have to imagine, you know, if you work at Coca-Cola, you might not be rooting for Pepsi to succeed uh, in quite the same way that if you work at a satellite company, you're happy when other satellite companies succeed because they're doing what you want to do. Maybe you want to do it a little faster or a little better, but like usually you want them to succeed. And that, that's, that's pretty fun. So I, I've loved almost everything about this industry, but there, there have been a couple things that I just find weird or that, that have disappointed me a little bit that uh, I have found uh, slightly lacking. Um, and one of them is, you know, we work alongside people that will do the impossible, the technically impossible, without breaking a sweat. Um, and yet, they act like solving culture or making a workforce more diverse is so impossible that they should never try. We work alongside people who literally, like, spacecraft to Pluto, yep, done it. Ready to do it again. Sign me up, boss. Humans to the moon, let's go. I'm so ready. Let's get our industry to be more than about 4% black and African American people. Impossible. That's someone else's problem. That's the colleges, right? We can't hire people who don't apply. It's not on us. Mm, I don't take too kindly to that. It's never sat very well with me. I've always been so frustrated. I was like, this company is full of smart, passionate people. You would never quit. You would never quit on anything. How many times have you seen an aerospace company have a bad day at the test stand or on orbit and quit? Never. We don't do it in this industry, right? A stage blows up on the test stand. We say, space is hard. You got to say that. It's in all of our contracts. Reporters have to nod and say, space is hard. It's an important job, part of the industry. And then you say, data is good. I learned something new. I'll be smarter tomorrow than I was today. I'm excited. Let's go get it done, right? And we don't think about that like when it comes to culture. Don't think about that like, don't think like that when it comes to the workforce. We either don't think about it at all, or we say, we tried a DEI program once five years ago. It didn't really work. Where's the, where's the rest of that sentence, right? What do you mean it didn't work? Why didn't it work? What did you try? What did you try again? If you had that reaction in any one of your engineering meetings, you probably wouldn't be showing up for work tomorrow. And you probably shouldn't be, right? You should go find another job you're more excited about. But why do we allow that? Why do we treat that as though it's impossible? I don't, get, I don't know why. Um, but the fact that you're here at a culture panel leads me to believe that maybe you share my frustration in that. Maybe you think that it isn't impossible, or certainly that we're way shy of the point of giving up. We should try some new things. I really want to, that's my main point today, is if you share that frustration of mine, if you don't think the culture at your workplace, or in your school, or in your rocket club, um, or in your professional organization is what you want it to be, don't give up. Do something about it. Uh, I went for a walk 
um, this morning. I took, had a long flight from the West Coast um, and just needed to stretch my legs after a long flight on an airplane that's full of people who were all actively eating and drinking and not wearing their masks for an entire six hour flight. Just needed to go stretch my legs and I stopped in to the um, Smithsonian Air, uh, National History Museum. Normally I go to Air and Space, but different museums open different days of the week. Hadn't been to this one in a while, so I stopped in and I went and they had a, uh, I found myself in a little room off to the side. I was the only person in the room and the, the display was uh, a lunch counter from the sit-ins in the civil rights movement and they had a video looping. I, was, I had the room to myself, so I was staying there watching and, uh, and they, had a, they had a quote uh, from, from one of the, uh, at the time he was a young gentleman, now, now uh, a respected elder gentleman, um, who was one of the students sitting in one lunch counters. And, and he said, you know, I just had this attitude that if you think culture is broken, well then fix it. If you think culture is broken, well then fix it, right? Now I want to be really clear. Uh, too often we put the burden on those who are disadvantaged to fix it. If you're disadvantaged, I hope you're trying to fix it. If you aren't able to, I get it. Um, a lot of us in this room are pretty advantaged. I'm certainly one of those folks, right? Um, I'm frustrated too, so I'm gonna try and fix it. I hope you're gonna try and fix it. I'd love to help you. I wanna share with you some ideas. I want a little bit of a story about a couple of things that I've done, um, not because I think they're all that praiseworthy, uh, just because things that weren't that hard, and I don't think that creative, have really succeeded, which tells me this is not an impossible problem. This is not intractable. This is not a societal problem that requires 100 years and a bunch of Nobel Prize winners to change. This is something where like individual actions have consequences. Isn't that nice? Um, so uh, I have the great pleasure um, of being a co-founder, as you heard in my introduction, of two fellowship programs um, that I've gotten to name after two people who were really important in my life. Uh, my friend Brooke, Brooke was a classmate of mine in graduate school, uh, went on to become a coworker of mine. Uh, we were housemates. She was a bridesmaid at my wedding, someone really, really important to me who passed away way too young. Uh, and Patty Gray Smith. Patty, uh, I didn't have the pleasure of calling such a personal friend, but she was really a role model of mine, someone I got to work with uh, and really admired in the industry. Uh, I, I do like to think that we were friends, um, uh, but, uh, uh, but mainly was someone I admired uh, more in, purely in the professional um, uh, zone. She, she was, uh, they were both people that uh, I thought brought a lot to this aerospace community in the two short time that they had with us. I put little QR codes there on the screen. I, I encourage you, if you don't already know them, please like find that later, or you can just go to the two fellowships websites and meet Patty, meet Brooke. They were really amazing people and I love to talk about them. Um, I, uh, I, I was in mourning, right? A friend of mine passed away, Brooke passed away, um, just shy of her 36th birthday and uh, of breast cancer. and. Uh, a bunch of us in the industry really loved her and we didn't know what to do. Uh, and uh, for those of you who ever had the misfortune of losing someone close to you, you know, sometimes even when you can see it coming, you don't want to admit it. And so none of us had ever talked to Brooke about what she'd like us to do to honor her memory, uh, which we should have, but we didn't think of doing it because we wanted to think she would get better. Uh, and so when she passed, um, uh, someone who has become a very dear friend of mine, but at the time was just someone I knew, uh, Lori Garver, sent out a note to a bunch of people in the aerospace industry and said, I love Brooke, I miss Brooke. I want to do something to honor Brooke, who's in. Uh, and she sent it to probably 200 people in the industry. And I wasn't one of them, actually. It got forwarded to me by George Whitesides, my boss at the time, who, who knew how close Brooke was to me and who knew Lori better than I did. Uh, and there were three of us, Lori, myself, and a woman named Cassie Lee, who all said, like, I'm in. I want to do something to honor Brooke. Like, most people, most people said, I'm in. Let me know what you want to do. I will write a check, or I will show up to an event. And we said, no, I've got ideas. Like, I want to, I want to put some sweat equity into it and come up with an idea. Uh, all three of us started having some meetings. What would we like? What would Brooke like? What would carry on her legacy? And at some kind of cynical slash fun level, like I'm gonna miss working with Brooke in addition to hanging out with Brooke, what would allow us to build an industry of more Brooks? How do we train more people to bring the spirit and the creativity and the purpose and the passion that she had to the workplace? Because that was a really valuable thing for the industry in addition to being fun to hang out with. Um, and so we thought about, um, doing a scholarship program maybe for women in STEM because that was a shared passion that all of us had and kind of looked at it and said, actually, there's already a bunch of those out there and I think they're run pretty well and I don't think they're broken in some fundamental way that I can address. So we could create a new one and that would help a couple students, but we don't have a ton of money. So if we're very successful fundraising, maybe we can do two scholarships and that helps two people and that's wonderful, but I don't think that changes the industry. What can we do at a higher scale? And we started putting together this program um, and combining a bunch of the things that we found the most impactful to us in our young careers. And we said, well, what do, what do young people need? Jobs. Jobs are good. 
first jobs are especially good, internships. Um, but we also said, well, hey, young people um, don't always know themselves sometimes, and they certainly don't always know the industry, right? That's one thing that you can't study academically in quite the same way that you can experience experientially. I don't know, it's not a very eloquent way to say that. Uh, but what that we found was that meant that a lot of young people, very bright young people, very dedicated young people who had spent a long time studying this industry didn't know what kind of jobs they want because they didn't know what kind of jobs existed. Right? You'd ask a lot of young people where they want to work and they would all say NASA or SpaceX because those were the two that they knew. And you start to talk to them and you'd realize, oh no, you might be better off at this small startup. You might be better off in the drone industry. You might be better off here. Let's start to make these connections. So we said, let's do an internship program, but let's involve this element of matching where we won't just ask them to apply to a certain job. We'll say, tell me what kind of companies you like, but also tell me what kind of attributes you like in a job and what kind of attributes you like in a culture. Do you want to be on a big team or a small team? Do you want to be in a startup or an established company? Do you want to be in a job where you're asked to do one thing extremely well or you're asked to do lots of things pretty well? Right? All these kinds of questions that some young people have never thought about or even if they thought about, they might not have had a chance to experience. And we could start to match up and say, I know you say you want to go here by name, but when I ask you to describe the job, you're describing this. So you know what, I'm gonna give you interviews at both of those places. Let's see what happens. Uh, so it was jobs with matching, and then it was mentorship. Um, because mentorship can mean a heck of a lot to a young person. Um, it doesn't take, it, it is possible to be a good mentor or a not so good mentor, and it's possible to train and become a better mentor over the time. But honestly, even someone who's not yet that good a mentor is a pretty good mentor, in my experience. Um, there's something I like to call the gear ratio of whenever a person with more experience talks to someone who has less experience. Um, let's imagine that someone listening to me in this audience right now, if this is your first day at your first aerospace conference in your first year of ever caring about aerospace, by the end of the day today, you know so much that would be valuable to a person who hasn't had that experience, right? Because you're gonna take the eight hours of awesome presentations and panels that you saw here at SGX, and you're gonna, in your mind, you're gonna distill that to your top 10 greatest hits. And some, one of your best friends from high school or the person sitting next to you on the airplane or the subway is gonna ask you, what did you learn today? And bang, 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 you're gonna say, oh, Alvin Drew told me this, and you know, whatever, Luke told me this, and you know, pass on these lessons you learn, and wow, they know a lot, right? Well, by the time you've been in the industry 20 or 30 years, right, my off-the-cuff top 10 list, doesn't matter, I'm not saying I'm smart or I'm well-connected. It's like I've been around a long time, right? I, I know some things, I know some people, and that, that can really help a student. Those of you folks who are my age, older, around my age in the audience, you've had this experience, right? Someone has asked you this thing and you've just sort of like tossed off this little thing that you don't even think about and they're like, holy bleep, right? I didn't know that existed. That's where I wanna go to graduate school. That scholarships exist? Oh my God, you just changed my life. You just saved me $10,000 in student loans. And it wasn't like hard, it didn't cost me anything. Right? That gear ratio is intense. So we wanted to uh, bring that, first it was to women, uh, and then as we learned from the awesome students and alums in our community, became women and all people of marginalized genders. That was the Brooke Owens Fellowship. Uh, this was a program that we started, Lori, Cassie, and I, our goal was to run 12 students through it. And we said, okay, if we do that, we'll have made the world a slightly better place, we'll have honored our friend Brooke, and we can go back to our busy jobs and families. Uh, and we're about to hit our 250 student mark a couple of years later, which amazes me. I still can't believe it. Yeah, thank you. I, thank you. I appreciate it. Direct your applause to the brookies in the room, of which I'm thrilled that there are several. Um, the other thing that I really loved is that people saw this model and said, that's kind of working. Can I do that? And this is one thing about, that's fun about working in the nonprofit world. Usually in the for-profit world, uh, if someone says, I like what you're doing, can I do that? You say, hell no, you'll hear from my lawyers. Right? In the nonprofit world, we say, yes, please. Like, I, can I teach you everything I've learned? Please, go and do this. I think the industry really needs more of that. So we now have five fellowships that are built on this model. I was very fortunate to co-found one of these with Alvin Drew, who's now your new astronaut friend that you met on the, uh, on the previous panel. Um, Alvin Drew and, and, uh, and Christian Jones and Tiffany Lockett, and I co-founded another fellowship called the Patty Gray Smith Fellowship. It's a very similar model. It brings the same elements of uh, matched mentorships, or matched internships um, and mentorships. It also has scholarship money and connections and a community and, and more, but this one's targeting the black and African American community. Uh, and we now have, uh, have run uh, 90 something students through that, through that fellowship in just our second year. I'm so excited about these things. These are 90 students 
probably 10 of whom would have had a job in this industry if it weren't for this program. Uh, and it's not because we did so much to help them and we're heroes. It's because they always had the talent and they needed someone to go knock on the door for them or to point them in the direction of the door. They didn't need a lot of help. They didn't need us to do it for them. We didn't have to lower any bars. No one had to say we're gonna accept low. These are awesome students. They are smarter than I was. I went to Harvard, my ego's not small. They are smarter than I was, right? For sure. And they work in interviews. They didn't even know where to apply sometimes. If they were, they were being rejected by computers because they don't go to the right school, they don't know the right keywords because no one's ever helped them understand that. So that gear ratio is really, really simple. Um, We've been lucky to win a lot of awards with these programs, and I'm really honored by that, and it's sort of also sort of baffled. I'm like, this wasn't that hard, right? Nothing, we didn't discover a new element. We didn't do something that no one else could have foreseen. We just tried something. We thought about what helped us. We talked to some other people about what helped them. We said, what's in common? What did we really lack? Well, let's go do it. Let's go try it. We didn't have any money. We never asked for any money. The money that was involved in starting the Brooke Owens Fellowship was uh, however much money it cost to get a Squarespace web page. I think it was like 450 bucks for the first couple of years. That was it. And now we got a couple hundred students through. And now the money has started to come in. We're looking to do even more. So I wanna, if you're motivated to do something, wh whether, whether your thing is helping more students get in or helping better use earth science data to improve our planet and its climate or whatever else it is, if you're motivated about something technical or especially something culture-wise, I want to just share you a few things for your consideration. I certainly do not have all the answers, but these are a few questions and a few tasks that have worked for me. I already talked about the first one. Um, recognize this gear ratio where five minutes of your time can be extraordinarily useful. If you're still a student, what that means is you should be asking for five minutes of people's time. You have this wonderful advantage when your email address ends in .edu and you are actively a student, you can ask almost anyone in this business for five minutes and they will say yes. And that becomes much less true the moment you leave school. It doesn't go to zero, but it becomes much less true. So please ask. And you can straight up ask people, you can say, I want your job, please tell me how to get it. Again, when you're in your 40s and you ask people that, they will take that as a threat. <laughs> When you're in college and you ask that, people say, good, I want you to have my job. And frankly, I want you to do a lot better than I did. Let me tell you everything I know. Let me tell you how I got there. Let me give you some suggestions. Let me tell you what I wish I'd done. Ask for it, right? Take notes, whatever your style is. Ask, if, if you know your path, ask people on their path. If you're like me, I had no idea what the heck I wanted to do when I was 20. Ask a bunch of people. Discover a lot of different paths. So understand that gear ratio. If you're on the older end of that, if you're on the more experienced end, be generous with your time. I know we're all busy. We've got, all got 100 hours worth of things to do in a 24-hour day. You can make five minutes, right? Everybody can make five minutes. Please try and make five minutes. I really encourage you to do that. Um, the second one I, I alluded to but hadn't directly talked about, um, a lot of you in this room are engineers. When you're trying to solve a problem, you don't pick one thing, try it once, and give up. You test. You iterate. You test you like you fly, right? These are just like the, the watchwords of our industry, the mantras of our industry, the things that are written up in nice corporate speak on a wall for you to walk by every day without looking at. But it's a philosophy that is actually lived by most of us, right? You try lots of ideas. You ideally have lots of people trying lots of different ideas. You try it and it never works right the first time. You go and break it. You figure out why it broke. You try it. Why would you only do that with hardware and software? Why wouldn't you do that with culture? If you tried having a booth at the SWE Society of Women Engineers conference three years ago and you didn't get any recruits out of it, does that mean you should never do it again? No. <laughs> it means you should try and find out why. Did you have the wrong people at the booth? Were you at the wrong conference? Did the people apply and then their applications got rejected by computers, which actually is really often what happens, right? Something broke in there. It doesn't mean it wasn't worth trying. It doesn't mean you should stop. Iterate it. Keep going, just like you do on the test stand with a rocket engine or with a PCB or whatever your favorite piece of hardware is. If you are frustrated by something, if you are pissed off, do something about it. There will be, in your life, I would guess, my crystal ball is not perfect, I would guess there will be very few times in your life where you're pissed off and you're the only one on the planet who's pissed off about that thing. Usually you're pissed off and all the people sitting next to you are pissed off about the same thing. Like, I can't believe that speaker just said that thing. Or, I can't believe this stupid airline just canceled my blah, blah, blahs. I can't believe that no one in the industry has built a thing that will do this thing for these things, right? 
If you have been waiting on a piece of hardware that's too late, you're probably not the only one who's waiting on that piece of hardware that's too late. If you've been annoyed by the fact that people keep saying manned space flight for generations, you're probably not the only one annoyed about that thing, right? Speak up about it. Do something about it. The burden is not only on you, but I invite you to do it. You may find people listen more than you expect. Uh, and then lastly, um, when you can, and again, not everyone can. Everyone's financial situation is different. Everyone's medical situation is different. Everyone's legal situation is different. But when you can, volunteer for the tasks that be seem thankless. Uh, we've heard some stories already today from people up on the stage about getting voluntold or volunteering themselves to run this exact conference, right? And some of you probably looked at this and said, ooh, I wouldn't want to do that. Uh, and I think if you talk to the folks who have done such an awesome job running it this year uh, or running it in the past, they'll be like, I learned all these things, I met all these people, I got these connections, I got this good experience, I was in the room where it happens, right? Uh, a lot of my career, a lot of my success has been because when I can, and I can't always, I got young kids and we got medical issues like everybody else, but when I can, I will raise my hand for everything. I was one of the annoying kids who sat in the front row of the class and raised my hand all the time. I'm not ashamed of that, but I've, I've done that too. Uh, at my work, I'm employee number one, I'm a vice president of my company, I've been a vice president since the day I started. I have done the laundry for people, um, I have let people stay on my couch. I have loaned my car to people. I have done reviews of like hundreds of pages of documents for like font errors and little things like that, right? Because you know why? If I do that, if I review the, review the 100 page proposal to look for font things, it's not a fun job. But it means I have the damn proposal on my computer. I got to read every word of it. I know exactly what we're talking about to every customer when I do that. I know exactly what our sales points are. Hardly anybody else in the company does, right? Even the people who wrote the proposal usually wrote one section. I know the whole thing, right? I volunteered to be the person hitting next slide at every board meeting in my company for many, many years. Now, guess who's the one person in the company other than the CEO that every board member knows the name of? I'm in the room where it happens, right? It was a thankless task, but it got me to do things. A lot of these fellowships, thankless task. I got to know people. I'm super excited about it. Um, I'm done now. I just want to leave up this slide as I, as I, as I go. Um, I like to be here, I like to learn. Um, I put up some things on this slide that I'd be delighted to talk to you about if you're interested and want to come talk to me. I also put up some things that I would love to learn from you. Uh, please put me to work for you. Uh, if there are things that you are frustrated about and you are not in a position to do something about them yourself, I might be. Um, so if there's something that wearing one of my hats with Brooke Owens Fellowship or Patty Gray Smith Fellowship or SEDS or Virgin Orbit or just myself, I can do something about it, please come and tell me about it. If there's a piece of data that doesn't exist. It's something I've been thinking a lot about in the industry particularly, so I put it as the first question. A piece of data that would help you better understand, hey, what is the workforce actually like and how does it actually need to change? I probably haven't thought of it yet, but maybe I can go help there be a study about it or find some money to find someone else to do, help do a study about it. Um, particularly those of you who are relatively early in your career or are still students, please tell me what you think you need to get started. I've like created multiple nonprofits to try and do that. I think we're doing a good job, but I'm sure there's 10 things that we haven't thought of yet that would be really helpful to our fellows and others like them that we just haven't been clever enough. So please come tell me about it. I'd love, I'd love if you want to share your ideas, I would love to help you act about them. And don't be shy. Uh, I will happily be, I'm not a licensed therapist, but in the specific contest, I am happy to be your therapist and listen to what frustrates you about this industry. Because again, maybe I have an answer, maybe I can connect you to someone who has an answer, maybe we can work together to go create an answer. Um, I'm excited to get to know all of you. I will say, I'm actually surprisingly a pretty shy person in these specific contexts of conferences and big groups of circles of people that I'm not already in and I will, will walk up and awkwardly stand at the edge because I don't know what to do. Uh, so I'll invite you to embarrass me into doing something about that and getting me into the circle. Please come and find me. I'll be around all day today and most of the day tomorrow. I can't wait to hear more from you. Thank you so much.